Okay, welcome back to Musicologist and the Nerd. I'm Nick. What are all these instruments doing here? Wainwright. And I'm here with our resident musicologist, Libby Concord. Hello. Good morning. Okay. Welcome to the COVID-19 scare. Woohoo! Yeah, so we're totally decked out in uh, gowns, aprons, masks, gloves, and, uh, and you know, just having a great time as we do it. And Nick just sprayed me down with something he said was disinfectant. I'm not quite sure what it was, but... Uh, trust me, it's it's fine. It's fine. Okay, good. Good. As long as it's not radioactive or anything, we're good. We're yeah, good. yeah. No, yeah. I'm only slightly... <laughs> well, we're here to distract you if you happen to be in quarantine, as we usually post these about two weeks after we record them, or whatever is happening in your day. We're here to talk to you about fun things like music. Yeah, and uh, continuing our season on musicals today, we've each picked a couple of our, well, I wouldn't say favorite, just a couple of books that we were interested in that have been turned into musicals, either movies or on stage. So we're going to start off with Libby and... Uh, let her go first and tell you uh, what she's been reading and what she's been watching and we'll go from there. Okay. Well, I actually had a little bit of self-quarantine these last couple of weeks because I had some surgery on my sinus, which was lovely. So if I sound a little funny, forgive me. Got a, so a little bit of swelling in my cheek. So I picked American Psycho and the color purple uh, because I had seen a little bit I'd seen the American Psycho movie um but I'd never heard of Amer of uh of the color purple until I think there may have been something about it in the Macy's Day Parade like they performed one of the songs uh I can't remember which one it was but anyway it kind of intrigued me and I had just never I don't really know anything about it so I picked two that I was unfamiliar with and um I will start with American Psycho so, Nick, have you read, watched, heard American Psycho? I've heard of American Psycho. Oh, yes. Well, uh, oh, and you did send me that really funny video of, um, oh my gosh, I don't even know who the artist is. It's Huey from Huey and the News, right? Yeah. Who is making fun of the most iconic scene in it, the the scene where, depending on which version you watch, uh, Patrick Bateman is murdering uh, Paul Owen or Paul Allen or whoever, whatever your version is, uh, with an axe in his living room. And he, uh, Christian Bale, as Patrick Bateman, is dancing around to Huey Lewis in the news wearing a raincoat with an axe. It's great. Anyway, we'll put the link to it down below. It's very, very funny. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so for those of you who've read the book American Psycho, you know that it is... Uh, it's a disturbing book. Um, as I was watching, I watched, did this a little bit out of order. I watched the musical first on YouTube because I was like, so excited. What? How are they going to translate this crazy book to a musical? And then I started reading the book and I was about halfway through and I was you know, like, oh, this is a really good, well-written book. Like, wow, this is really cool. And then I watched the movie and I was like, eh, okay, isn't that cool? I remember that. And then I read the end of the book and I was like, oh, dear Lord, this man needs help drugs, possibly to be hospitalized. Whoa. Uh, so American Psycho is the story of Patrick Bateman. He's in his mid 20s. And he's a Wall Street broker, I guess you would call him. And his father owns one of the big firms. And so he basically doesn't have to do anything. He just shows up in his Armani suits to uh, his job and does whatever he wants all day. And then he spends most of his time getting facials, massages, working out, taking slutty women out to really nice restaurants, hanging out with his fellow brokers, stockbrokers at the newest, hippest restaurants. Tough, tough, tough life. It is. It's really tough. Lots of cocaine, lots of cocaine, tons of drugs I've never even heard of before. Uh, basically, if you can get a drug for dietary needs, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, ADHD, anything, these Wall Street guys can get it and they can take it and mix it with cocaine. And it's great. Well, with cocaine, I think that, yeah, that, that makes sense. You mix anything with cocaine and you're going to get some, you know, effects there, right? It's going to be great. We are both just, you know, we love our cocaine. All the cocaine. <laughs> oh my so gosh. So much cocaine. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know us, uh, Nick does not even drink. 
and uh <laughs> no 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 yeah i do not even drink caffeine caffeine i don't either actually but not for the same reasons but yeah no we are definitely the opposite of these people in this book so basically have you ever read the uh silmarillion by J.R. Tolkien. Okay, I'm a nerd. I'm not quite that much of a nerd. Don't worry, I'm not either. I bought it and I tried. I tried real hard and I got stuck, just bogged down with the the son of the son of the son took this item and did this with it with the son of the son of the son of the son. Well, American Psycho is basically just like that, except that every person who he comes in contact with, he tells you exactly what they're wearing down to their socks. Wow. And they have long conversations about how you can't wear white socks with gray trousers and how to wear your suspenders and what kind of lapels you should have. And he knows, I mean, every person essentially to him is just one giant consumable item. So you are what you wear absolutely applies to everyone in this book. Okay. I have had those conversations with people. Really? And white socks with gray trousers, that would just be awful. And, I think it'd be fun. And it's an American thing. White socks is definitely an American thing, and it's awful. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe you and Patrick Bateman would get along. Maybe. I don't know. I don't want to say that. He's crazy. Okay. Well, yeah, as you go more into it, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see how well you'd get along. Um, by the way, lots and lots of spoilers. Have you not read or watched or listened to any of this? There t were lots of spoilers today. Just FYI. So he's going along. He has his perfect girlfriend, Evelyn, who eventually he'll probably marry. And, uh, you know, they're just going through their life and... By day, he does all those things I talked about. He goes to work, he gets his facials, he goes out to dinner. And by night, he beheads women and puts their vaginas in his fridge. Okay, yeah, a uh, big difference between me and him right there. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking so. I'm thinking so. So, yeah, he starts off. Uh, yes, definitely some explicit things to come. He starts off when he's younger by raping people. And then he tortures animals as serial killers usually do. And then he gets it gets really crazy. Uh, those of you who know me know that I don't watch gory films. And if there is a commercial with a puppy in it, I will sob for two hours. Uh, this book was a little bit tough to get through the end of. <laughs> um. And now I'm curious, what made you decide to choose this book? Well, watching the movie, I remember it was it was gory, and I haven't seen it since 2004, so it's been a while. Um, but it just, I really wanted to know how do you make a serial killer's life into a musical? Yeah. Okay. Curiosity. Yeah. Total curiosity. I just, you know, and the movie was not, I mean, it wasn't a walk in the park, but it wasn't uh, crazy. You know what I mean? Like, sure, it, you yeah. know, it could have, it could have been worse. So yeah, I just, I wanted to see it. Like that's, that's an off the off, you know, weird one. I wanted to try that one. Anyway. So as we go along, it becomes evident that Patrick is kind of losing his mind. He ends up killing uh, that iconic scene that we were talking about he ends up killing this other stockbroker who has the fisher account which is apparently something incredibly incredibly valuable that everyone wants to have and so i've got this bookmarked in my in my thing here in my book hence the crinkling paper uh so yeah he this is when he takes in the book paul owen and he takes him out for drinks and he kind of grills him and he's like, how did you get the Fisher account? I don't understand. How did this happen? And Paul just gets really, really drunk and can't, and can't or won't answer his questions, won't tell him how he succeeded in getting what, what Bateman thinks he wants most. And so he, Patrick Bateman ends up taking him back to his apartment where he has purchased a brand new axe. He has a chair on top of a whole bunch of newspapers and he ends up murdering him. Uh, this is important because later he uses Paul Owen's apartment to bring women back to and murder them. So you go through this whole crazy thing in his head where he is basically losing his mind. And uh, yeah, and the, by the end of the book... He goes back to Paul Owen's apartment and nothing's there. None of the bodies he left. I mean, this, they're super gory, awful sights and they're all just gone. 
Hmm. And so you kind of start to wonder, is he crazy or is he so strung out that he just doesn't even know what's happening in his own life? So basically, one passage that really dominates the, I think, sums up the book and dominates the movie and the musical is this one. I thought I'd just read it to you. Okay. So this is Patrick Bateman talking about himself. There is an idea of a Patrick Bateman, some kind of abstraction, but there is no real me, only an entity, something illusory. And though I can hide my cold gaze and you can shake my hand and feel flesh gripping yours, and maybe you can even sense our lifestyles are probably comparable, I simply am not there. It's hard for me to make sense on any given level. Myself is fabricated, an aberration. I am a non-contingent human being. My personality is sketchy and unformed. My heartlessness goes deep and is persistent. My conscience, my pity, my hopes disappeared a long time ago, if they ever did exist. There are no more barriers to cross. All I have in common with the uncontrollable and the insane, the vicious and the evil, all the mayhem I have caused and my utter indifference toward it, I have now surpassed. I still, though, hold on to one single bleak truth. No one is safe. Nothing is redeemed. Yet I am blameless. Each model of human behavior must be assumed to have some validity. Is evil something you are or is it something you do? My pain is constant and sharp, and I do not hope for a better world for anyone. In fact, I want my pain to be inflicted on others. I want no one to escape. But even after admitting this, and I have countless times in just about every act I've committed, and coming face to face with these truths, there is no catharsis. I gain no deeper knowledge about myself. No new understanding can be extracted from my telling. There has been no reason for me to tell you any of this. This confession has meant nothing. Interesting. I love the line about evil. Is evil something you are or is it something you do? And that'll actually go into one of my books that I talk about here later. Ooh, that's so, exciting. Uh, yeah, that that one uh, that was interesting. It's it's a really good book, but it's really awful. I don't know how to describe it exactly. Um I think the thing that stood out to me the most is that so he'll be having a conversation, Patrick Bateman will be having a conversation with his friends, and they'll all be talking about what type of socks to wear with their trousers. And he'll slip in, I love to cut the throats of young girls, and then continue talking. Nobody hears him. Happens multiple times. He tells his girlfriend, I had to return some videotapes, and then I murdered a homeless man and his dog. Nothing. She'll say, oh, Patrick, your sense of humor, I love it. Huh. I mean, nobody, they're all either so drugged out, so self-obsessed, so it, they're also surface that he, he's right. He almost doesn't even exist. And he has to keep pushing the bounds of drugs, of sex, of violence, because he can't even feel that he's really there. It's kind of crazy. I'm glad I've never experienced that personally. Okay. And I think that's kind of true of a lot of drug users, though. They have to keep pushing the bounds because they they get kind of uh, more of a sedative effect. It just kind of wears off and they have to push it over and over and get worse and worse. And then you see them doing some really crazy things. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those that don't know, I work in a sheriff's office. I see these people all the time and they just progressively get worse and worse and worse until they snap, break, die or decide that they have to get better. But yeah, it's... And none of those kind of apply to Patrick Bateman. I mean... He has a breaking point where he calls his lawyer and he says, I think I've murdered more than 30 people. If you go to this location, you'll find someone's heart. If you go to this location, you'll find someone's head. Like he eats human flesh. He drinks his own pee. I mean, it's horrific. Ugh. And he confesses all of this to his lawyer, who then mistakes him for someone else when he talks to him about it and says, that was a great joke, Davis. That was hilarious. Patrick Bateman has no personality. He's totally flat. There's no way he could pull any of that off. Great joke. And so then Patrick just goes right back to living his same life. Holy cow. Yeah, it's... Well, and the thing that's even crazier... So this book uh, came out either in 1990 or 1991. I've heard... I've read various things online, but I'm checking in the front of it now. 1991. 1991. Um, so it's, it's written by Brett Easton Ellis, and he was about the same age as Patrick Bateman when he wrote this book. He was about 26, 25, and he at first said it was a reflection of his father who was very abusive, which is a terrifying thought. 
that this person could be your father. Uh, yeah. Terrifying. Then later he admitted, he said, I didn't want to say it, but I was living that life at that time. That was me. This is, if it's autobiographical of anyone, it's of me. To what extent? That's what I want to know. Um, so this book is misogynistic. It is uh, anti-gay, uh, very strongly anti-gay. It is, um, it's just, it's got all of that in there. And so people who like it say that it is a comment on a capitalist society run out of control. People who don't like it say this is just a man expressing the worst possible side of himself. And it's awful. <laughs> I found it captivating to a point. By the time he's really losing your mind, losing his mind, it's almost impossible to read it. It's so horrific. It's just the things that he does are so horrific. So I both recommend that everyone read it and that nobody read it. Okay. Uh, I will take that into consideration. Probably go with the latter. Yeah. But, uh... Watch the musical, though. Do watch the musical. Okay. Now, I got to know how this translates into music. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, so probably most of you have seen the film, which was kind of panned when it came out in 2000 with uh, Christian Bale as the lead character. It had actually quite a few famous people in it, which was surprising to me when I watched it again. And I thought, oh, oh, yeah. When I watched this before, I didn't even think about the fact that Reese Witherspoon was his girlfriend or, you know, there's just all these all these kind of famous people pop up. Um, so interesting fact, Gloria Steinem, big, uh, women's rights activist, uh, hated this book. She thought it was just, she's one of the people who said it has misogyny written all over it and it's terrible and it should be banned. She is Christian Bale's stepmother. Wow. Uh -huh. Okay then. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in rewatching the movie, it's kind of become a cult classic. You haven't seen the movie, right? I've only seen that one clip. Mm, that one clip. Yeah. The, that's... That's yeah, it. That well, the first time I watched it, I watched it in a vampirism in film class, which uh, I took I took one summer semester at Portland State uh, because I wanted to live in Portland. And uh, with my with my best friend, Liza, we wanted to be living down there. And uh, I had to take classes in order to live in student housing. Hmm. So I took vampirism in film and they showed this movie. And as a young woman who'd only ever watched movies that were basically G or PG, this was a bit of an eye opener because um, it's violent. It does not even come close to the book, but it is violent. Um yeah, they were really worried that it was not going to be uh, approved to be shown because of the violence in it and the overt sexuality. And if if you want, I mean, the movie is a hollow echo of the book, just totally hollow echo of the as book. As often is the case. But... but particularly so in this case. I mean, you probably 50 pages of the book ended up in the movie. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and that scene that we were just talking about, the scene where he murders Paul Owen and has Huey Lewis in the news playing, is really interesting because maybe as part of his psychosis in this book, uh, Ellis has Patrick Bateman spend a whole chapter telling you about his love for Whitney Houston or his love for Phil Collins, his love for Huey Lewis in the news. And he basically details to you their career, their rise through music over four or five pages just sort of thrown in there and um it's really interesting because the way they translated that into the movie is that they play those songs and have him tell you about it while he's committing these horrible murders so i thought that was a really good way to sort of integrate you know, obviously you can't go into the amount of detail and just playing the song wouldn't get convey the same thing. Sure. that That's actually a pretty cool way of taking the book and translating it to film and maybe even giving it a little bit more meaning than spending three or five pages describing it. Yeah. Well, and what makes it even creepier is he's describing it to you just like we're talking here. You know, Huey Lewis and the News, they broke onto the scene in 1980 and they were a big deal, blah, 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 as he's pulling out a rusty hanger that he's going to use to kill you. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, but he's got this great big smile on his face and he's so handsome and so charming um, before he murders you. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that I thought that was interesting. I think the movie was my least favorite of the three. 
really didn't like it as well going back and watching it. Um, the other really big scene in the movie is at the beginning, he's talking about all the things that he does to make himself beautiful. So he goes into the shower and he uses a couple of different scrubs, one to make your skin glow, one to remove, like open up your pores. And then he goes and he puts on um, all of these lotions. He does a mask. He puts ice on his face. Don't put cologne on your face because alcohol dr uh, dries your skin out, makes you look old. He, all these tips that he's doing, you're watching him do this. And in the movie, one thing that's really talked about a lot is how he peels this face mask off that he's wearing and the look on Christian Bale's face is just, you know, from that moment that he like, literally there's nothing there. He's just a psychopath and there's no humanity left. And this is like five minutes into the movie. That was a huge scene. And in the book, he, they talk about all those things, but that's nowhere near as iconic, you know, uh, as indicative of what's going to happen later in the movie. So it, it really needs a face there. And Apparently, Christian Bale has that psychotic face to just pull it off. He does. He he certainly did in uh, 2000. He was a hot young thing. Just psychopathic enough. Um, yeah, so that's what I thought of the movie. There were a couple other things, too, that um, were differences between the book and the movie that were really interesting. So they... In the movie, they really emphasize the fact that he doesn't see himself as human. And they start off with that at the beginning. So that paragraph that I just read to you, mm -hmm. that is the premise for the whole movie. And it just kind of um, ramps up as he goes along and becomes, that's, that's how the movie begins and it's how it ends. And that's kind of the thing. Rather than in the book, you sort of over time accrue this sense of him being invisible, this sense of him being part of this collective that actually doesn't exist i feel like that's a very common thing book to movie things that they take a long time to develop in a book you know little subtle things that turn into big things they just slam right at you in the movie mm -hmm. and it's it's a little disappointing to see when that happens because they they have such great subtlety and they build and there's this all this development and they just totally forego it yeah i i agree with that and i felt like they were so focused on um the, the violence that he was going to do that uh, they didn't quite, I don't know, they, they sort of missed the, the larger point in a way. Um, yeah, but there were a few things like for the movie, there's a scene where he murders an escort and a prostitute. And in the movie, to make it more dramatic, he murders the escort. And the prostitute realize what's, realizes what's going on and runs out of the room and go, is going down these stairs to escape. And he drops a chainsaw on her and cuts her in half, basically, from like six stories above her. That's not in the book. Hmm. But it was very dramatic. It was super dramatic. Yeah, I could believe that. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was that was one big difference. Um yeah, it was it was really, you know, they 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 softened it a lot in the movie. They softened the book significantly. Um he's not all the time using the F word, and I don't mean F U C K uh when talking about other men. Um he's it's just it's softer somehow. It's it's more palatable for regular consumers, which is kind of funny since he thinks of things and people as equally consumable patrick bateman does so the musical yes okay <gasps> thank god the musical we're finally talking about what nick came here to talk about oh my gosh okay pause and put this book down pausing um i loved the musical very interesting you hated the book you hated the movie to a lesser extent, and you love the musical. Yeah. I I would say I enjoyed about three quarters of the book and then hated the ending. Really blasé about the movie. Felt really flat. But the musical, oh my gosh, I probably listened to it seven times in the last week, um, mostly because I was trying to focus and drown out everybody else freaking out about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was... It was really good. Um, so the musical was, oddly enough, first put up in London, not here. Uh, it's a very American story, but it premiered in London in 2013. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which definitely surprised me. 
And I thought that the music was really, really good. Um, the music and lyrics were by Duncan Sheik. Um, and the book was by Roberto Aguirre Sacasa. Probably just butchered that name. Anyway, you a Doctor Who fan at all? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I may have told you this earlier in the week, but guess who's the star of the show in the London one? Okay, you did tell me this. Was it Matt Smith? Yes, it was. I would never have thought that you would see him in a musical or that he would play this big, beefy, muscular person in a musical, which he did a fantastic job of. I Yeah, he seems so scrawny and British. And kind of dorky in a way. Like, that sounds mean, but Patrick Bateman is the ultimate cool kid who would spit in your face before he would do anything else. Yeah, exactly. And that just isn't Matt Smith to me. He's the doctor. He's wants to save the world. You know, he, I don't know, but he really did a fantastic job. Um, yeah, the musical came out in 2013. It eventually came to Broadway in 2016. And then as far as I know, it's playing in Australia right now, although they've had such a crazy year with the fires and um, then this uh, outbreak that who knows what it's doing now um but so i'll link we will link below to the broadway or excuse me the we will link below to the london recording from 2013 the original uh probably west end cast and it's uh it's on youtube it's fantastic recording a lot of people really panned matt's uh acting his well no that's not true a lot of people really panned his singing they really didn't like his singing. They thought he didn't do a good job at all. He didn't have that Broadway voice. He didn't, it wasn't a full sound. I loved it. Hmm. I thought it was great. <laughs> um, I also listened to another version on YouTube. Yeah, so we'll we'll put a link below to the London version and also to another version that's on YouTube. It doesn't give a lot of information about where it's from, uh, but I'm assuming it's it's Broadway. Uh, it's very good. The Broadway one was very good as well. And the singer there has quite quite a bit more vocal, more of a robust vocal sound than Matt Smith does. But somehow it really works for Matt Smith not to have a robust sound, which is really interesting. So the musical really sort of crystallizes the story it breaks it down to just key moments in the story and again like the movie it chose to be much less violent and overtly sexual than the book which is probably good although critics said that the storyline was kind of blasé and that people who went to it either only went for the music or to see the violence so yeah i i feel like live it'd be really hard to kind of get that whole that whole thing together but i don't i haven't that whole you're like inside his head kind of thing yeah Yeah. i don't know how how would you really show that and bring that out live on stage and then you know gory murdering and all that on top of that well and some of the things he does there's no way you could show it on stage and actually get permission to show it i mean you'd have people like picketing the theater it's so crazy. Um, yes. So it is definitely less violent, but the the scene where Paul Owen is killed uh, with the axe, the iconic Huey Lewis in the news scene, they do it that way and they do it as they did it in the movie, basically. But what's cool is this scrim comes down and it blocks the audience from getting blood on them. Huh. Yeah. So, you know, most scrims are often cloth. This one looks like it might be a little bit different. It might be maybe a plasticky material. Honestly, the YouTube video is filmed from inside someone's sleeve, I'm pretty sure. So it's not particularly wonderful, but it's really cool. They're able to, he takes this axe and swings it at the other actor and it just blood goes everywhere. So I'm not quite sure how they did it, but it's very effective and really cool. And... Yeah, it's it it actually I thought was really they did a really great job. The other couple of scenes that they really choose to highlight, so there's one moment that kind of sums up basically a lot of what goes on in the book where the different Wall Street brokers that Pat Bateman hangs out with 
look, I'm calling him by his shortened first name. It's like we're friends. Um, that, uh, that Patrick Bateman hangs out with, they all put their business card on the table. And who you are is defined not only by the suits you wear and the car you drive and your attache case, but by how cool your business card is. And so they're all looking at these and, oh my gosh, well, you only have Times New Roman. Oh, well, he has this other font that's amazing. Look at how thick it is. And essentially, it's a euphemism for admiring each other's dicks. (laughs) But uh, yeah, it's a business card. And they do a great job of bringing that and of capturing the feeling that he's just sort of an actor in his own life, essentially. And the only part I didn't like and this is going to sound really strange. The only part I didn't like is that to capture in the in the version you can actually watch, which I'm assuming is the Broadway version. Again, they don't have a whole lot of info up there. The filmed in someone's sleeve version. Um, so the thing that I don't like is that when they are trying to portray all the crazy sexual acts that he does on screen, they originally have him with the escort girl and the prostitute who he sees multiple times. And then they have these really weird drawings that look like they're taken from the joy of sex and drawn by a four year old (laughs) that are being projected on the screen. And all the actors are in like aerobics outfits and are going around like in being in these different sexual positions. And it's just like, you might as well have skipped it. You know, like this doesn't, it, it makes it feel funny. And it's not funny. No. I, I see the need to convey, you know, the sexual nature of it all. But that's just kind of a weird way of doing that. It's really strange. And it makes you feel like you're at the circus or something. Like, it's really, really weird. Um, and also, at the end, instead of breaking up with his girlfriend, he marries her. Which I thought was actually a really clever deviation from the book. Because... Part of his breakdown in the book is that he basically tells his girlfriend to just shove it because she's all surface. She, you know, when she's arguing with him, we can't break up. She doesn't say, because I love you, because I need you. She says, because we have this past together. We have all the same friends. It just doesn't make sense. And that's so surface and shallow and... Exactly who he is. Yes, it fits exactly. But I think for him, that's a little bit of a breaking point. But in this one, he marries her anyway and just goes on with his life after he's murdered 30 people you know like i mean it's and somehow she's totally oblivious totally oblivious it's yeah it's crazy but i thought it was really well portrayed i thought that the actual violence was really well portrayed they showed paul owen's apartment like after um after Patrick Bateman had committed a lot of these atrocities. So the walls are drenched in blood, the floor is drenched in blood, all of these things. And so it implies it without you actually having to see it. So he does end up killing three other people in that scene, but it's so much less graphic, so much less graphic than what's in the book. Um, Yeah. So how do they fit the music into this though? Well, there you go. There are some absolutely beautiful rewritings of these popular songs that he talks about in the book. Mm-hmm. So they've got uh, they've got "In the Air Tonight" by Phil Collins, who he just adores. And when I forget which character it is who sings it, it's one of the women, and you feel like you're in church, like mm-hmm. she's singing Ave Maria. Um, when I was in Italy when I was a lot younger, we went into a church in a small town up into the hillside. And there was this woman that came every day to sing Ave Maria and just weep at the church every day. Hmm. Yeah. When she left, the priest was like, she, she comes every day. She cleans a little bit and then she sits down and she sings Ave Maria. Like, like she's dying, you know, like this is the last utterance she's ever going to have in this beautiful, you know, hundreds of years old stone church. And that's kind of the affect that that song has it's powerful um yeah it's really great and there are a couple other songs uh don't you want me that's in there another pop song and everybody wants to rule the world and they're harmonized really well the whole cast sings them and they dance and they sort of look like robots 
which really evokes that, you know, and he has all these fluid movements and is talking to you while they're singing sometimes. And it's, it really puts him apart, but he's still part of it. It really conveys, I felt like that he is invisible, yet very much present. Um, Both the book and the, or sorry, both the movie and the musical leave out one other thing. These brokers are continuously mistaking each other for someone else Hmm. because they're all essentially you know if you went and looked at all the barbies on the shelf right they're all barbie at the heart of it right even if one has a briefcase one's a doctor whatever they're all basically the same and so a big part of the book is he keeps getting mistaken for someone else he keeps mistaking uh other people for different people and that kind of got wiped out of the musical in some ways uh he doesn't confess to his lawyer a detective comes to talk to him in the book. That's wiped out. But yeah, the music is just stunning. And you actually, you sort of empathize with him, even though you know he's evil. I mean, he's absolutely evil because of what he sings. Um, it's very 80s. It's very angular. Uh, lots of party lights. You can get the club feel. But the music brings you back. Like you want to hear it again and again. And um, one of my particular favorites um, is A Girl Before, which if I'm remembering correctly, is his secretary kind of singing about her love for him and how she sort of always goes for dangerous men. Hmm. And at the end of the book, she's really the only one who still loves him. And he's kind of dating her, kind of not, but she can't see his evil side somehow, or maybe she does but thinks she can fix him. This song features a bass clarinet oh very nice very nice one of the one of the great instruments probably second best even oh yeah i would say i would say second best only maybe soprano clarinet is better (laughs) yeah yeah that's 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 the the one one you were thinking Uh, of uh Uh uh-huh absolutely Uh uh-huh yeah Mm -hmm. i know it's the contrabass we all know it's the contrabass um yeah but it's it's just gorgeous i think they probably play the bass clarinet on a keyboard it's a little fake sounding but Mm. that kind of fits because it's the 80s sure yeah um yeah, it was just fantastic. Uh, like I said, I listened to it over and over again this week. And it's just, it's really, really beautiful. Which is kind of weird because it's such a dark subject. Yeah, and now you got me intrigued. Now I'm going, I don't think I'm going to go watch the movie. I don't think I'm going to read the book. Um, I may watch the the play, but I'm definitely going to listen to the music. Listen to Matt Smith's version the london version is so good the other thing i liked about the london version is they open it up with uh snippets from 80s commercials which just sort of reinforces the like we're not really people we're just consumers kind of thing which is really cool they did a great job on that one um yeah trying to think what else i had to say about this it was it was fantastic i i would go see the musical live okay so if it comes And there's no crazy quarantine. We're going. It's happening. We'll add it to the list. Okay. Okay. Uh, That's pretty much all I've got. uh, Which one would you like to talk about? Okay. Well, I think I'm going to uh, continue on with this kind of what is evil theme that you had going there. And one of the books and musicals that I picked out was Wicked. And the book was by Gregory Maguire. And if you don't know... um, This is the story of the Wicked Witch of the West from... Yay! Yeah, from The Wizard of Oz. And that's the subtitle. It says, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West, which is really interesting because that title doesn't really come to her until the very end of the book. And the story, this story is literally her life from before her conception all the way through her death and then just a little bit beyond so it encompasses her whole life, and it it's a really oddly written book. Did you, like, oddly written as in you're not enjoying reading it, or? Oh, no. I love the story. Some places just fly by. Some, some things the author dwells on oddly long. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's been a while since I've read it, but I would agree with that. So the... The story starts out with a very long, in-depth description of her parents and how much her mother really despises her life 
and may or may not be cheating on her husband all the time. Just not quite sure about it. No big deal. Yeah. And then it goes on to how she definitely cheats on her husband all the time. And uh, it just, it spends a lot of time dwelling on that in what ultimately isn't a huge, you know, part of the book. It definitely sets up for some stuff, but I feel like it could be all summed up in about half the words that it was. It, I'm sure the author would love to know that. <laughs> yeah. It was also a very slow start to the book. It took me forever to get through it. And I was not really, you know, looking forward to the rest of it after that. So, but fortunately, the main character, Wicked Witch of West, her name's actually Alphaba. Once she's born, it kind of starts breezing through everything. Talks very little about what she's like growing up. And then she's off to university called Shiz. She meets all the cast of players there. Pretty much every main player uh, comes within, I want to say, 10 pages when she's first at the University of Shiz. Um, and that's her, Glinda, who is the good witch in time. Eventually, yeah. Eventually, yep. yep. Um, there's her sister. There's a whole cast of various male characters. There's uh, Bog. There's uh, Averick there's fiero so they all kind of establish a bond pretty quickly now the course of time it takes some time but it's all just it goes through and he he has a good pace for this it just goes right through and it really establishes that she's an outcast Mm -hmm. but there's a whole bunch of outcasts and they're all really outcasts and it establishes kind of the big actual part of the story here so it starts early a lot of books um actually one of my uh, co-workers is just reading the harry potter books mm, yeah and the first one it's like three quarters of it is all set up for the series and then the last quarter is plot totally and, i hadn't thought about it that way but it she really does have to create the world first before they can live in it yeah exactly yeah this book it's the first eighth of it is kind of setting up and then the plot starts so early and there's so much of it. And there's so many subplots that there's, it's kind of hard to see the overarching theme of the whole thing because it just, she has so many different things that are changing through her life. So there's a whole lot of racial tensions going on there. It's described as animals, which are like animals that have souls. Um, so how they're treated, how they're kicked out, how they're doing. So that, that continues throughout um throughout but it's really a bigger thing in the beginning then it goes into a tyrannical government with the wizard being this uh, overlord that wants to just take over everything and his power grows and how she's fighting him uh then it goes on to how uh individuals can fight the resistance and then how all these small little countries can create their own government and like all these sub governments and it's it's really interesting it's really hard to summarize yeah uh, agreed it is yeah but it it has so many subplots but it's really cool because i mean that's what our lives are they're subplots there's not one giant plot in a life and it is a summary of her whole life so one of the big themes that she follows throughout the whole thing that she questions herself is what is good? What is evil? So Alphaba, uh, born into a very religious fam- family, her father was a preacher, which caused immense stress on her mother, who stayed at home while the father went everywhere. And the father was very strict with this, really pushed it into Alphaba, her sister, Nessa Rose, and uh, her younger brother, Shell. And they, so they all kind of took it differently. Alphaba completely shunning all religion altogether. Nessa Rose being completely devout. And then um, it doesn't talk a lot about it, but Shell really just turns more into a military man. Mm -hmm. So they're all completely different ways of coming out of this raising. So they, they take a lot of... Okay, so Alphaba being one who is very not religious and essentially doesn't even believe in the soul is trying to determine in her own life what is evil. 
she spends this this phrase this question comes up several times in different parts of the book and she asks different people this and there's a couple of major religions there and she's asking people of both religions and some people are like well you know there are evil people and some are like well evil is the absence of good and then a lot of them just don't really give her a good answer and she ponders this question throughout her life now essentially she is the most good person there it wasn't till the very very end of the book where she states um, as she's doing something that this is the first time in my life i ever remember lying Hmm. yeah she is very honest Mm. okay yeah so she's one of the most honest people and she lives her life doing everything she thinks is good which is interesting when you go into the book and it's called the life and times of the wicked witch of the west well you know the victors do write the history it's it's absolutely true (laughs) um and actually you find out at the end it's more of a ironic title um it's it's kind of a joke and she puts the title on herself as and it kind of sticks a little so she she lives her life she does the best she can but she also maybe doesn't do the right thing uh like her friend fiero he is kind of the crown prince of the little village he lives in he was uh married as they say from the age of six. Oh wow but didn't actually get to see his wife until he was 18 and then there was just absolutely no love between them um to the point where his wife said well If you want to sleep with one of my younger sisters, feel free. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And she had five younger sisters. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, But she was kind of a interesting person. She had absolutely no love for Fiero and really not a lot of compassion for her sisters Mm. to the point that if they even had names, she just kind of quit using them and numbered them. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. Yeah. So she was one, but she went by her name. And then there was two, three, four, five, and six. And that's what they called each other. And that's what everyone called her was their numbers. That's terrible. So Fierro, being kind of the big main guy of this village, he often spent his time in the big city, the Emerald City. And he would have to go there for business. And on one of these business trips, he happened to come across Alphaba years after they had gone to university. And really was just interested in what her life had turned into. She had run away during college. She just couldn't take all that was going on, the indoctrination, everything at the school. Yeah. And so she went to fight the power and was kind of hiding out, being a resistance fighter in the Emerald City. And after a little time of kind of following her around like a lost puppy and trying to force out of her what was going on, they had an affair. Oh, no. Like, continuous all the time. Also, this book, not great for little children because they describe in very, very good detail about what, they, what they're what they going through um, in the most random of times, too. The book is completely blasé and plain. Um, and then, boom, there's a sex scene in great detail. So, well, And the only thing I remember about their sex scene is that she wanted to have sex with the lights off and he wanted to have sex with the lights on because he wanted to see her and she's like, but I'm green and ugly. And he's like, no, I want to see your body. Like, oh, okay. Or something like that. Maybe it was the opposite way. Maybe he wanted to have the lights off. I can't remember. No, Something no, about it, the lights. Yeah, yeah. Something something right about there. Mm-hmm. And it's It goes into some really full detail on that. It doesn't... That seems act, to be a theme right, of and, our books. <laughs> and it doesn't play into the overarching story at all. Mm. They could have said something like, and they had a fair, you know, and it would have really done good. But he spends a lot of detail on that. He also spends a lot of detail on uh, Elphaba's mom having an affair. Um, so it's kind of weird. I don't know. That was his thing, apparently. Apparently, but only a couple times, just right into it. And that, that kind of turned me off from the book a little because a lot of time was spent to that. But it you know, the whole story as a whole was so good that I could kind of forgive it. Right, right. So now during this time where she is having this affair with Fiero and she's a resistance fighter, she's really ramping up. The emperor, the the wizard has kind of declared himself an emperor, is really just taking all the power. And um, 
she goes and she's fighting the power and Fierro's like trying to see what's going on and just resigns himself. And then they kill him. <gasps> yes, the Emperor's forces just decide, this is something you love. I'm going to absolutely just kill him now. And it's a bloody, gruesome mess, huh. which there are several of. They just, a lot of people die in this book. Yeah, I remember that. A lot, just a lot of people die. And it's gruesome and they really don't hold back. And Elphaba just doesn't, doesn't know what to do with herself. And she kind of goes into a stupor, like a deep stupor for a year. Can't remember anything. She ends up in a, in a nunnery. Oh, wow. Uh, or something of the sort. They call it, they have interesting names for everything in this book. Um, and she, after she kind of comes out of her stupor, she takes a vow of silence and basically becomes a nun for, I think they say seven or eight years. Hmm. And at one point she decides she has to break her vow and she has to go and ask for forgiveness from Fierro's wife. So she travels way far away on this big dangerous uh, route all the way over to uh, the land where he comes from comes up to the wife and says, Hey, I have something to tell you. I, you know, really want to explain about how I feel like Fierro's death is my fault. And the wife's like, no, just a very plain, you're not going to tell me anything. I know you're trying to like make yourself feel better. I have my ideas about this. So no, you just, you can't tell me. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she spends years trying to do it. Oh no. And then she's just totally knocked down. Yeah. Just a, a flat. Nope. Not going to happen. Wow. So. Do you think the wife was jealous or just she, didn't care? She just didn't care. She had no love for Fiero. Mm, yeah. And she was now kind of the ruling power. Although several times they pretty much say that she was low class mm. until she got married. She had to learn to read after she got married. So she looked a little more, you know. Right. She's more polished. E exactly. She fit in a little better. Yeah. But her sisters definitely weren't in... There was a constant fight of looking looking the part throughout mm. there. Uh, a really random interesting thing, too, is that when she goes traveling, they the nunnery sends this little boy off with, uh, with her kind of like to handle her things or something. And it's heavily implied that it might be her son and her and Fierro's son that... I she, remember that. That was, yeah. And I mean, the thought that you could have a baby while in a self-imposed coma, yeah. kind of like, wow, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. So it, she progresses, she changes, she kind of develops a look. She teaches herself magic. She actually didn't, when she was at the university, they like, hey, you could do sorcery or you could learn like humanities. And she's like, oh, definitely humanities. Why would I ever want to learn magic? <laughs> I would never want to be a witch. Yeah, no, no. So, um, but her roommate, Glinda, decides that she wants to learn sorcery. Um, her sister, who is deeply religious, uh, it's like, oh no, sorcery is not, that's not the, what our unnamed God wants us to do. No, no, no. Oh, oddly enough, her sister doesn't have arms. <laughs> oh, I'd forgotten that point. Yeah, yes. Kind of a big point, actually. Uh, you know, no big deal. No arms. No, just no arms. So like Glind, uh, so Elphaba, green skin, born with green skin, kind of caused her issues her whole life. Nessa Rose, her younger sister, no arms, kind of caused issues her whole life. Younger brother was fine. Uh, was was he consumed or consumed? Oh my gosh, was he conceived in wedlock? Um, well, his parents were married. Very high likelihood that it, his father wasn't his father. Okay, yeah. because that would seem, you know, like oh, you know, you two were our bastards technically because you were, you know, your mother was married, but she was cheating on your father and then i don't know interesting point actually the person that the wife uh that Elphaba's mother was cheating on or cheating with her father also really loved him and said it towards the end of the book stated how much he actually loved him and their son is named after him oh so strong suggestion that perhaps uh they were more than friends, yeah, the well, mother and that guy, other than were, just... I mean, they were just... Uh, they were good friends. They traveled together for years, but there was that strong suggestion. So the the person that she cheated with was named Turtle Heart, <laughs> and they named the son <laughs> Shell. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. I was wondering why he was named Shell. It's been ages since I've read this book, probably 15 years at least. Okay, yeah. And so... 
Okay, so she teaches herself uh, a little sorcery. Nessa Rose ends, ends up teaching herself some sorcery as well because, you know, she, you could use it to really benefit God's work. Or, Do good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and her father decides while she's at school to send her some really cool shoes. They're all bedazzled with red rubies. and uh, About dang time, he's shelling out the good stuff. Right, right. Um, this also kind of grinded on Alphaba, who didn't get a really fancy gift like that. And Glinda, who was their roommate, decided that she was going to help out Nessa Rose and enchanted the uh, the ruby slippers so that she didn't need to be supported. Now, not something you think about very often, but you use your arms to stabilize you all the time yeah, for everyday things. So she had her like nursemaid, Nanny, help her out with everything, including walking, just being her support. So wow. never in her life was she able to do that. Well, these enchanted ruby slippers helped her to do that. Nanny was kind of out of a job at that point. <laughs> Poor Nanny. But it also kind of gave Nessa Rose a big head about it all. Hmm. So Nessa goes back to the little um, area that they're from, Munchkinland, and she kind of becomes the ruler the it talks about it a bit throughout the book the eminent thorpe and how they're the ruler of munchkin land and it's passed down through the female line so it was her grandfather because he didn't have any sisters and then the actual next one in line would have been um alphaba but they kind of presumed her dead because she had disappeared for such a long time so nessa rose became the eminent thorpe she became kind of the high ruler of munchkin land wow and she was kind of a tyrant about it. Literally a witch uh, about it, in fact. Uh, the One of the best examples there, Elphaba comes back for a visit. She gets to sit in when her sister is talking, you know, with somebody from the village. The village person's like, well, you know, I have this, this maid working for me. She, she's great, but she wants to get married to this woodcutter. And it's going to... Uh, it's going to kind of kill everything I have going. So I'd like you to curse his axe so it kills him. <gasps> and Nessa Rose is like, no, I can't do that. I'll curse his axe so it only cuts off one of his arms. <gasps> yeah. That oh, my be, gosh. That's terrible. Yeah, because no no girl's going to want a one-armed man, one-armed woodcutter. He's, yeah, no. <gasps> and it turns out she is kind of terrible. She's pretty awful. Wow. Um, and it goes into a whole discussion of animals that have souls and like using them as, you know, like cattle and whole political discussion about that. And it, she's just gets this reputation for being a real witch and gets the nickname of the Wicked Witch of the East. Uh-huh. So, uh-huh. And because that that nickname went around, that's when Alphaba is like, well, I guess that makes me the Wicked Witch of the West. That's right. So That's right. They joke amongst themselves about it, but it really spreads far and wide, and they those titles kind of stick. So when Dorothy's house comes, flies, lands, and boom, there's Nessa's ruby red slippers. Hey, look at that. Wicked Witch of the East is dead. Those r- red slippers, Nessa's like, well, you know... Elphaba, you could have them when I die. Oh, no. So she so, really wants those slippers. So Glinda shows up and gives them away. And being kind of a sentimental thing from their father, Elphaba is like, no, no, no. You can't give those away. They're from my father. I need those back. Those are family heirlooms. They're mine. They're rightfully mine. They were told. She told them it was mine. You cannot do that. So she starts going, going down, following the path, meeting a bunch of people that she knew. Getting hints, falling back, and everyone's like, oh, this Dorothy's amazing. She's so sweet. Do not, you know, do not do anything bad to her. I'm sure she'll just gladly give you the shoes back. And um, and this is kind of where it picks up from it, the... From the movie. From yeah. the movie. Or the other books, yeah. Yeah, and it it's really based on the movie here. And it's kind of just a slightly other side. She essentially captures Dorothy. They bring her to dinner. They have a chat. Um, they have a little scuffle, bucket of water. She dies. Wizard flies off other world as he does so. Um, movie doesn't show this, but as he flies off and goes back to his world where he came from, his castle is stormed. The resistance comes to remove him as the emperor. And hey, look, it was... he happens to be gone. Yeah. So, and it was it was a machine the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
he was more just sadistic and power hungry. And there's, there's a lot of those power plays in this book. Hmm. So I know like with, uh, with the book you just went over with American psycho, there's this overarching theme of, you know, capitalism and how he was just self-absorbed and all this murder and all this wicked really didn't have that. It had so many little subplots on it. It's kind of hard to really see what it was talking about, like, or what if there was no overarching theme. So part of that was, you know, are you born wicked or do you have wickedness thrust upon you? Hmm. What is evil? There are all those. And there's all these little things in there that they are breaking down. Like the emperor does good, but he does it in a really cruel, awful way. You know, he's kind of like a mob boss. That's how they kept people on side is they would do really awful things. But then the people in the neighborhood, they'd be like, oh, your child needs shoes. Let me give you shoes. And oh, I'll do this good thing for you, but it's going to cost you. Yeah. And he he started that way and then turned into Saddam Hussein. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. So some progression. He got more and more power hungry as Mm. it came. And he was the one who saw that the animals could be causing him some issues. So he basically exiled them. So... Animals in the book with a capital A were animals with a soul, ones that could speak, that could write, that had, you know, were sentient beings, sentient beings, more sentient then, than regular ones. Yeah, animals. and then animals with a small A were animals as we know. So there was a big differentiation between those two, and even much uh, so much as one of the professors at Shiz was a goat, and he's trying to come up with proof, saying that hey, we are so close to humans. You can't, you know, just kill us and all that. And then he gets their throat cut. Ah. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of these little what is good, what is bad. And a lot of things that you could kind of relate to our world. And when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, this is obviously about slavery. This is obviously about this. Except it breaks it down so much more finite. There are so many different things. He adds... More like you could say, okay, this one's about the plight of black people. This one's a plight about Asians during the Second World War or something. I think he's just coming up with whole new ones because there's there's a whole bunch of plight. And you could relate to any of those things as you want. Right. Um, but it's it's a good perspective on life as a whole and how it can turn. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like it. Well, and... Um... It, why, you know, why get it, make it just be related to one thing? Why not have it be, you know, an overarching theme that can include all of those huge mistakes that humanity has made, the internment camps and uh, slavery and all of those things. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And because of that, because it's so overarching like that, it takes forever to read. Mm. It's only about 400 pages long. It's not a huge book, but he goes into so much detail about so much stuff. Added on top of that, he just makes up words and names. That's which, fun. Yeah, which just slows everything way down. And you just, so you, but you really get into it. He forces you to slow down and to take in what's going on. Hmm. Yeah. So. Did you like the book? I loved the book. You loved the book. Loved cool. the book. The first, like, 30 or 40 pages, it took me forever to get through. And then, and I was discouraged. I was almost ready to give up the book then. And, and then, then you were like, wait, I have a podcast. I can't do that. Exactly. That was exactly. So then I <laughs> continued on, and I loved it. The rest of it, it all made sense. I even forgive him for the, the first bit there. So good, it all good. worked out. Now, the only problem with this is I, I've never actually seen the play in person. Mm. I've seen part of it on youtube but i know the soundtrack like the back of my hand i have heard it so many times and as i'm reading through this um i'm thinking this is not at all what the musical is like musical is very very different very different because the the soundtrack very much outlines what the whole musical is like and it's it has some very similar themes it has uh you know, it has the, you know, there's a little bit of the plight of the animals, but it's not so much of, oh, look that they're all getting, you know, repressed by the, uh, the wizard. The wizard's actually like 
kind of boasted as a good guy. We're off to see the wizard. Yeah, we're going to have a great day in the Emerald City. Well, when they actually go to the Emerald City, it's actually kind of a like clandestine and like sneaky and dark. And it was awful. Mm-hmm. Uh, it had an underbelly. It definitely did. And even what was happening in the daylight was was not great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then then it's all cheery. There's all this dancing and singing and all that. And Nessa Rose has arms in the musical. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to either A, find a singer with no arms, or B, figure out how to costume that person so they didn't look like they were just a giant box? Yeah, yeah. No, I I was realizing that. Um, if you haven't seen it, they make her unable to walk. So... It is. It, it does take away from it a little bit. I've never seen it either, but I've listened to the soundtrack many, many times as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I actually was just watching the first half of it yesterday. I got really busy, so I, I have yet to finish it. But the the musical is amazing on its own. Yep. It is a great story on its own, and it does it, a fantastic job of telling this great story. It is not the book. It is very lightly derived from the book. I feel like that's a common theme. It's really reductionist, but in a good way. Yeah, well, it's, it's, I think he, the, the author of the musical kind of just used, oh, look, there's a green thing. And here's some names that, that were similar. And it's about the Wizard of Oz. So, hey. Everybody will love it. Ready-made audience. Yeah. Okay, let's go. And then created an amazing soundtrack. Yeah. So, I will say, I absolutely recommend reading the book. I absolutely recommend watching the show, and I absolutely recommend repeating the music, uh, the soundtrack so loud that your spouse wants to kill you over and over and over again. <laughs> but uh, the book and the musical really shouldn't be considered the same thing. Just not at all. Yeah, otherwise I think it does take away some of the enjoyment. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because... I sat there watching the musical. I'm like, no, no, no. But no, no, that's... No, Fiero wasn't introduced like that. He wasn't even almost killed there. He's supposed to be almost killed. Come on, he's dancing. Fiero's shy. Come on. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's kind of how I felt about uh, the two musicals that I did this time, too. Felt like they were missing out. If I'd done it, I would have done it so differently. Yeah, yeah. What's yeah. your favorite song from the soundtrack? Oh, see, that's... That's tough. There's so many great songs. Now, okay... Let me pull up the list. That way I can start talking a little about this here. Okay. So original cast was uh, Kristen Chenoweth as Glinda and... Um, Adina Menzel. Adina Menzel. As so Alphabon. great. I love her. There is no way that I can associate those roles with anybody else. Well, and apparently they hated each other by the end of it. Oh, yeah. I, I, I not even at all surprised with how much interaction they had mm -hmm. there. Um, so some amazing songs there. So popular just sums up the role of Glinda so much. Yeah. She's really only concerned with surface. Absolutely. And on the, the stage show that I watched, I'll put a link down below for the YouTube one. If it's still there, <laughs> it is so much better than the refined, you know, music that's out on, you know, out as part of the soundtrack. Because there's so much more personality there that just shows you how awfully surface she is. And it's way funnier. Yep. Um, there's so many great songs. So the first song I've ever heard from the Wicked soundtrack was Defying Gravity. That is my favorite. That's it my is absolute favorite. So good. Um, just not at all. Again, like. No, that's not how the book goes. But um, <laughs> just let the book go. Nick. Just, okay, let gonna... the book go. So that one, that one's what got me hooked. But um, I think probably oddly enough, my favorite is Dancing Through Life. I liked that one too. It's this big musical number. It's just, I don't know. It's happy. It's joyful. It's, it's a big ensemble number. Mm-hmm. Which, well, and it's very much, you know, just enjoy the posh, polished, you know, rise as high as you can. Just see the good in things. Ignore all the bad things. Yeah, it's yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. um, and musically, it's my favorite as part of the story. Doesn't doesn't do anything. It's not one of those songs that advances the story in any way. No, but musically, I love it. Yeah. 
Defying Gravity for the play definitely is one that advances the for story. For the musical. Yeah, yeah, for the musical. Yeah. So it advances the story. And then there's lots of in act two, lots of darker themed as she progresses on from the kind of innocent college girl into the wicked witch. So things are changing. And so the, the music does a great job of telling the story on its own. So that's why I've pretty much know what the, the play is like, because I know the soundtrack so well. Yep. So it's, it's amazing. Like I said, watch it, listen to it, read the book, but, Never shall the two be considered the same. <laughs> I think it's actually kind of like Harry Potter because I definitely remember seeing the first movie and thinking, yeah, I, I guess that's a good representation, but you got to think of them as two completely different things. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's Harry Potter's a little different. At least it's the same story. Yeah, it's true. That's true. And yeah, it's very you, recognizably the same story. There is no one on earth that would be a better Snape than Alan, Alan Rickman. I know. There's never been a better McGarnacle yeah. than anywhere. Those those two roles could not have been played by anybody else. So the casting was perfect. And there's every time I read the books, that stuck in my head. Actually, funny story. Um, the other day, sometimes at work, it gets a little slow, especially at this time of year. Um, we have a big influx of tourists during the summer right now it's cold so everyone's hiding inside it's cold and covid yes that too <laughs> so my coworker and i are both reading books and we're both just kind of staring off because we've been staring at our own pages forever so she's reading the harry potter series <laughs> good and she's choice taking forever to get through the first book so i uh, I'm like, okay, how many pages do you have left? She had like 18. So I grabbed her book and we had story time. I oh, read the fun. end of her book. And then I'm like, okay, your turn. I handed her Wicked and she she read for two hours. Uh, to That's keep perfect. Me going. It was great. And uh, I think yesterday we read the first half of the second Harry Potter book. So Wow. See, that's awesome. I actually, I've been trying to get Nate to do that with me. Yeah, it's I think a, that'd be fun. It's a great way. You know, every 50 pages or so, we are trading off and it keeps you engaged in the story and it saves your eyes. Well, and that's what people used to do before radio and TV. A lot of times you'd gather your family around and you'd read to them from the newspaper. You'd read to them from a book. Yeah, yeah. Now I have to grab my own copy of Harry Potter and finish off the second one because you can't just stop halfway through. I know, right? That's just rude. It's yeah. just rude. Yeah, no, I know I didn't spend as much time on Wicked as you did with American Psycho there. Well, there's no movie intermediary there's, for that one. I was going to say, though, um, I heard Wicked sort of like I was introduced to Rent at a variety show, like, a, oh, gosh, what do they call them? A review. It was at a musical review. And so it's, you know, everybody picks a song that they really like and they sing it. They don't all have to be from the same show. And so somebody did Defying Gravity. They did popular and they did define gravity. So I went back and listened to those songs endlessly for like probably th two or three years before I actually listened to the whole soundtrack. And when I went back and listened, I was amazed at what a good job they did of musically thematically tying it all together. And um, it was fun to listen to it and see what parts of the show fed into defying gravity. Mm -hmm. And it sort of having read the book, it sort of alluded to the points in her life that allowed her to allowed Elphaba to become what she was. Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really interesting. And that was one thing I did not find with American psycho. It was, you know, the music was very, very good, but there was not as much thematic connection um, because there were a lot of pop songs. There was a lot of connection to the book, but not a lot of did drive the story. Yeah, the musical thematic connection was not necessarily there, except in the, there were other connections, like st the style of music. And um, it, it was well done, but it just wasn't quite the same where you really get those light motifs. And, sure. Yeah, yeah, but it was, you know, it's just interesting to go back and have one particular song that you really love and pick out pieces of it from the rest of the show and be like, wow, this was all building towards this moment. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. Wow. And the music in, in Wicked is definitely like that. It is the story. There's a little bit of talking, but there's so much music. It is the story. Mm -hmm. Now, I was actually introduced to uh, the music from Wicked, and you're going to judge me, and a lot of people will, but it was from Glee. <laughs> See, I don't watch Glee. I purposefully don't watch Glee. See, back, back when it was in its heyday, I watched it all the time, and they had like a big thing on Defying Gravity. 
So they I had, bet they did a great job. I actually would go back and listen to that. Uh, they did. And it was there was a big it was a big like, oh, should a boy be, spe- uh, you know, singing a girl's part and all this. And uh, the the kid that was singing that just nailed it, including the high notes. He wow. He nailed it. Um, so really cool. And like natural voice, not even into like his head voice there. So wow, or going up into falsetto. Yeah, or anything. That, well, yeah. exactly. Wow. So, um, but I will say my favorite version of that song currently is uh, Peter Hollins and Nick Patera. Hmm. They, they sing it. Uh, they actually just have a medley of of uh, wicked songs. That's really good. Uh, they're both kind of big YouTube singers. And Nick Patera is kind of really well known for having an amazing falsetto. Huh? Like a very realistic soprano falsetto. Wow. So I think he's normally a tenor and he has a really nice singing voice in general. But he goes up into his falsetto and it's just so weird. You close your eyes, you would not think it's him. And he just, he he sings so many songs in that in that medley that just really adds to it. I'll put a link below. Um, yeah, he, we should link to the Glee one too. Glee, I've listened to a bunch of their stuff. Like their uh, their covers of Journey are amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, the, the show's too, uh, I just didn't get into the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but the music's worth The music there. is really good. Yeah. The music is really good. That's cool. I'm gonna have to go listen to both of those. Yeah, I'll yeah, I'll hold you over after we're done here. Okay, you do that. <laughs> Yay, music time! <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't get much of that. I know. We've had a really good time talking about these books and musicals with you and the odd movie, but uh, we got a little too into it, and we've decided that we're gonna break this into two episodes probably a good idea i think we're probably going to be about an hour at this point yeah so we're gonna we're gonna break it up so in the next episode we will talk about the color purple and hamilton (laughs) ha ha hamilton our favorite well you know didn't always make it into the top five but it should have okay all right see you next time next time